Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name's Dan Dixon. Uh, over the course of the next 20 minutes or so, I will explain my rather lengthy job title, but also give some overview into how we innovate within HSBC and give some specific examples of how we've done that across our natural language journey. So simplistically, you can think of HSBC as four chunks. You've got three revenue generating arms in the retail, the commercial, and the investment bank. And then everyone else is the global functions or the back office functions. We sit in a central innovation team who serve all of those and help them experiment. In my role for data and AI, that means I help educate, evangelize, and experiment with different opportunities for their business problems. It's worth talking a little bit around how we innovate, first of all, because I think that frames the natural language journey that we've gone on. We're quite big believers in crowdsourcing innovation. So we're in the process of rolling out one single idea management tool across the entire bank. That then becomes the repository for people to raise ideas, but also to put in solutions as well so we can learn and reuse um, what's been successful in other parts of the business. Um, for those of you who were in the panel earlier, talking about how siloed some large organisations can be, that's not just around data or tools, that's also around ideas as well, so we're trying to break that down. The other... Uh, part worth calling out is how we view solutions and I think um, in Himanshu's speech just now he was talking around people trying to balance the solutions that are needed here and now versus the stuff that's out there in the future. This isn't unique to HSBC by any means but um, very simply Horizon Zero is stuff that's been used already. Horizon One is stuff that's incremental improvements. Horizon Two are new innovations or new solutions that are new to us or new to particular areas of the bank. And uh, the Horizon 3 is the real groundbreaking stuff that's out there and new to the world. And the reason for framing it in this way is when we talk around a particular problem that our finance function was having. Um, our finance function is quite large. Um, like most finance functions I'm sure people have come into contact with, there's a big dependency on Excel that we're trying to break away. Our finance function's done okay in terms of breaking that away, rolling out dashboards and visualizations, embracing RPA tools to try and automate processes that are currently done today manually. And that's part of a shift is where they try and position themselves as more of a partner for the business, um, breaking away from the traditional finance view of the checks and balances and moving to more strategic partner for the business. So what have they done? Well, they've rolled out some chatbots that can help frame and direct people to commonly ask questions, to make understanding data definitions more accessible to people. There's been those dashboards, there's been some experimentation with time series forecasting for projections, and we've done quite a lot around um, upskilling our people. We've been pushing design thinking courses that we've built in collaboration with Stanford and some citizen data science learning pathways so the average finance person understands more around statistics, around coding, around data science principles. But report writing or commentary for these reports remains a problem. Um, and we have a lot of reports. We're talking uh, thousands upon thousands of reports that are pushed out each month uh, in a bottleneck around the middle of the month once the data is finalised. And there's a small army of people who are writing those commentary. So our challenge is twofold. Can we automate that? Um, we'll refer to that as a descriptive level one commentary explaining what's happened. The second part is slightly harder, the actual genuine insight around what's happening around the data. So if we think of back to that horizon framework, we had three key requirements to start with. And as we progress through this, we'll see how those, our understanding of the requirements evolved as, as we took on new solutions. But we, working with our business, we needed uh, any outputs to be accurate and trustworthy. We needed them to be produced in a timely manner because those reports are pushed out in the middle of the month and they need to, needed to be relevant. So there's no point if we're looking at a cost report, looking at our legal function, which is a tiny proportion, when actually a minor shift in, in our IT budget could change and there's much more material. Because we wanted to, to innovate quickly um, and we're really trying to embrace that spirit of innovation and failure is good and failing fast is better. We, the, the build versus buy debate 
debate didn't really come into play. We wanted to just get going quickly, um, reuse solutions or, or code bases or open source packages that had already been used either within the bank or outside. And although we didn't want to put too many restrictions on how people did that, we built a basic framework around a six-step process for how people would design those notebooks so that we could compartmentalize them and if we had to unpick them or look to scale them or apply them elsewhere, that it could be easily interpreted. And ultimately, it worked. We were able to produce some reports and some applications that would describe what's happened in the comments. Um, they were accurate, they were timely, and they were relevant. They were accurate and relevant because they were hard-coded, but they were still automating part of the process. One of the observations is that where the data wasn't well-defined up front, that was, that was a big bottleneck, that slowed us down. And to echo a previous point as well from Himanchi's presentation, the, the stakeholder management was difficult to, to maintain or difficult, difficult to, to rein in sometimes. There was a fair amount of scepticism on one hand, and there was also some unrealistic expectations around what natural language solutions could do. And because these are more custom-built, single-purpose, hard-coded applications, they don't fit neatly into an operating model. They're essentially an end-user compute, but coded up. So that, that led us to looking a bit wider and looking at some fintechs and the, the native cloud apps. We added a couple of requirements in terms of scalability and making sure there were controls around them. One of the things we did is we created some ML pods taking data scientists from different functions across the bank, um, across the back offices, back office functions, uh, and set them into little pods, uh, assessing the cloud applications. This wasn't purely around natural language. We also looked at time series and classification tools as well. But for the purposes of this, we, we explored for the AWS, uh, the Azure, and the GCP uh, cloud native apps. We ran some demo day events to cast the net a little, little bit wider, get some, some fintechs and some startups to come and present how they would do that. We did that to our entire innovation community, which was a couple of thousand people. And off the back of that, we got two solid use cases, we think, um, that became proof of concepts using mass data on the cloud. We learned that, again, the underlying point is it's still a problem that could be solved. It was a more acceptable operating model. Um, certainly with our IT folks involved, they felt it was more manageable. It would fit into their current suite of applications, things like change management or SLAs around defects or issue management. It, it was, they felt a bit more comfortable that this was more natural to them. But they're still not plug and play. Um, and ultimately, they're still... Uh, describing what's happened with the surface level data. They're not going to tell you anything that you haven't coded or trained it to do. So we added a couple more requirements. Um, we wanted it to be more intuitive and more conversational in tone. We wanted it to be predictable, um, which a bit of a spoiler there. But um, So what we've done there is we've worked with, we've examined things like DeepMind's Gopher, OpenAI's GPT-3, uh, Google's Lambda, uh, and, and Hugging Co. as well. Um, we formed a couple of partnerships with some of those um, and a couple of other ones. And we working with Microsoft on their Azure OpenAI beta program to see whether that power of GPT-3 um, with all of its potential uh, and constraints at the moment can be harnessed and used within a, a corporate environment like HSBC's. The, the, the power of GPT-3 is, is pretty impressive, uh, particularly in the creative space. It opens up new opportunities for natural language. Um, things like Codex uh, are, could be a huge, of huge value to HSBC, and, and we've been pushing for people to learn to code. That could be a nice control around it. The fine-tuning models um, are definitely needed to, to train the model, have the human in the loop, make sure that the results are predictable. Where we've used this for a competitor analysis case, um, that allowed us to share, use public data that's out there rather than passing on our, our own data to OpenAI. Um, 
you could put in the same inputs, the same prompts 10 times and get 10 different results. They're mostly good results, but the lack of predictability or transparency becomes a problem if we think of the typical governance structures around uh, model management within companies like ours. And there's also you need to recognize that, that those capabilities bring that high risk. There's been a lot in the press around um, different, different applications having um, negative effects and things like um, you're being trained on the internet. It's not just that it's um, not necessarily relevant to HSBC's data and information and, and content, but also with the risk of bringing in anything that's controversial, should we say. So that uh, how we can impart our controls around bias is, is something that needs to be examined in the future. Rattled through these, but uh, by way of a recap, um, the, the horizon methodology has been a good way to help frame expectations. It's been a good way to help us work with our stakeholders and uh, different stakeholders from different areas of the business with different expectations around what's, what they need and when. So having three different routes, three different avenues to explore around what's achievable and when has been quite useful. There's also been a tendency in, in the past with applications to, to build, roll out one system and it's, it's out of date within two years. Having a clear roadmap around what's coming in the future or what, could, what might be possible in the future um, helps us minimise the risk of having legacy systems that have been proliferated through HSBC. And it also means that the fintechs we've started working with, they're not necessarily the fintechs we're going to work with in the future, but they're proving the capability. And that's been the important part as well, to get the business buy-in that this can be done, um, but not at the expense of just building hand-coded solutions that um, then need to be managed in the future. So we have a few observations and reflections for anyone who's, who's partway on a journey or be thinking of kicking off a natural language journey. Uh, the first three all relate to that kind of culture and expectation management piece. It's important to recognise that human language itself is nuanced and, and sometimes difficult to interpret. So it's, it's understandable that a machine is going to struggle with that. It's important to call out there's no silver bullet. There isn't a, an off-the-shelf solution yet that you can just plug and play when it will solve all of those problems. Uh, and, and as I said, the, the horizon structure is a, is a way to manage expectations, both from our stakeholders and for our own, so we don't feel like we're being pushed into a certain route or a certain avenue for a tool that doesn't give us any room to manoeuvre in terms of a roadmap. That, that cultural readiness does need to be managed. Um, HSBC is a 150-year-old organisation. It's built on ledgers and paper ledgers and paper transactions originally. We're a bit behind the curve, so we can't really compete with the Facebooks and the Googles and the, the big tech that's out there today. We've had to invest quite a lot of time and will continue to invest time in, in preparing our people and making sure they understand how and when this could and should be used. And part of the way we've done that is when we've done these proof of concepts or proof of value, we've focused on the value rather than making it clear that it's a, a dollar save. One of the things we found is because certainly the Horizon 1 and Horizon 2 solutions are still in that descriptive space, all we're really saving from the report generation process or the commentary writing process is arms and legs. What that does mean is people who are currently typing out that X has gone up by Y, they can now focus on casting their net a little bit wider, looking at exploring more data sets, bringing in some genuine insight. And I think that's been a big part of where we've been successful is, is getting the buy-in from people rather than people feeling like their jobs are being threatened by, by AI. It's a general principle that we have in the innovation world, but start small. Um, proving the value quickly or failing fast is important. Um, one of the lessons learned from one of the earlier commentary POCs we did is that they wanted to bring in just too many data sources, too many geographies, too many products. That just caused too many delays. There were too many people involved. By honing it in and one or two SMEs and understanding their, their inputs, their reports and outputs today, that, that was a much better way of working in terms of two, two or three two-week sprints and getting showing output, showing progress. 
and in, similar, in a similar vein, framing the problem statement is critical. So again, we're big advocates of design thinking. We've started using design thinking workshops to make sure all the stakeholders involved and, and our team and any other data scientists involved um, are, are brought on board and they understand the outputs, they understand the objectives up front. So what's happened before, and again in one of the POCs, it was quite iterative and we would ask for some data and have a weekly call with the team. A week later, they hadn't got the data, so we come back a week later and all of a sudden two months have passed. By having a kickoff workshop, uh, it doesn't have to be design thinking, but anything that brings everyone together on the same page um, just saves time later on. And in the same way, cleansing the data, knowing which data is needed, having examples of output reports up front to compare against and set your success criteria with um, is, is also a, a big lesson learned that we've incorporated in how we do this for going forwards. And finally, I think the, the rapid growth and hype around things like GPT-3 and, and Gopher have really shown that there's a lot out there that we don't know yet. So having that flexibility um, in terms of a roadmap and being able to answer the senior folks in the organisation that this is broadly where we think we're going, we've got some room to manoeuvre, um, is really critical. And I don't think we necessarily have this in the, in the time series forecasting or classification spaces, but for natural language, it feels like there's a, there's a natural roadmap um, that, that we're able to pin our achievements and POCs against. That, in record time, is that. Any questions? <laughs>